Hi, and welcome to Red Book Summer Beach Reads Book Club. I'm Tiffany Blackstone, a deputy editor at Red Book. I'm here with two of our favorite authors, Emily Giffen, whose new book, The One and Only, just hit shelves yesterday, and Jane Green, whose new book is Tempting Fate. I'm also here with Meg Foy, who's our senior web director, and Jade Green from Goodreads. Jade? Hi. <laughs> um, yep, yeah, I'm Jade Chang from Goodreads, and I'm one of the editors over there. Uh, in case you don't know about us yet, we are one of the world's largest sites for readers and for book recommendations. We have over 25 million readers all over the world, so you can always find a friend to discuss books with you. And it's not just readers. We have over 100,000 authors who have also joined Goodreads, including Jane and Emily. So it's really great to be here with you guys. I actually read both of your books and loved them. So let's start off with the basics, ladies. Uh, in 30 seconds, can you give us maybe a synopsis of your book and a little bit, bit of backstory? Um, Emily, let's, let's start with you. OK. Uh, well, the one and only is about a 34-year-old woman. Her name is Shay. She lives in a small town. In, uh, in Texas, a football-obsessed town. Oh, I'm looking here. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking right at Jane. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's about that moment in, in her, your life when you, you sort of take stock of everything and you say, am I living the life that I'm meant to live? Am I really meeting my destiny? Or is, is, am I just doing these things because it's safe and easy and convenient and just good enough? And for Shay, that happens at the, the start of the book. An event happens to sort of puts her on this path to, to you know, and um, I think, but it happens for all of us at various points in our lives, I think. Um, and so um, with Tempting Fate, um, well, the inspiration started when I noticed a number of women around me in my mid-40s living in my suburban Connecticut town suddenly um, announced that their marriages were over, um, everything was, was uh, they'd been unhappy for years and of course they'd start to look very skinny and very gorgeous and you mm -hmm. would invariably find out they'd be having an affair. So I started to really think about well, not just women's infidelity, but what happens to a woman in her 40s and, and, and I realized that for so many women, we give up our 30s to, to look after our children, and a lot of women give up their jobs as well, and all of a sudden you're in your 40s, your kids are in grade school, they don't want you, they don't need you, and you start to feel irrelevant. Um, and I also, I will confess that I, I did an author event, um, one of these book festivals, and I was on a panel with this very young, handsome author <laughs> who started sending me these rather flirtatious emails, and I am very happily married, and getting these emails was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. Um, so I, I thought, you know, I, th this has to be the topic of a book. And so I created the character of Gabby, who's 43, lives oddly in a suburban town in, in Westport, Connecticut. Can't imagine why. Um, but she does, she finds herself, she goes out on a girl's night out and finds herself um, being chatted up by this young guy. And, and of course, it, it starts on email, it becomes this email flirtation, mm -hmm. and not for a second does she think she'd be unfaithful, it's just she feels alive, mm -hmm. and it's all about attention, it has nothing to do with her husband, she tells herself it's got nothing to even do with this man, it's about feeling noticed and seen, and it becomes very seductive until she finds herself standing on the edge of a precipice. Well, I have to say, <laughs> That's perfect, because that leads into one of our first questions, which is both of your books kind of deal with these grown-up crushes, which is what we like to call them. We all have them. Mm -hmm. But do you think in real life they're usually dangerous, or can it just be kind of like, oh, maybe I need a little bit more excitement in my life? You know, is it like a signal to you, or mm -hmm. is it really a sign of there's something wrong? You know? Do you want to Yeah, I, well, I, I used to think that um, if somebody has an affair, it means there's something inherently wrong with your relationship. I have to tell you, I've, I've revised my opinion um, yeah, because yeah. I think even the happiest of marriages become pots and pans after a while. You know, when you've been married mm -hmm. for a very long time and it's, it's kids and it's, it's driving children to soccer and, and everything becomes pots and pans. And I think for a woman who feels invisible, 
it, it's not about infidelity. Mm -hmm. It's about, it really is just about being seen. And what happens with women is they get emotionally involved. It often starts mm -hmm. on social media and Facebook, and and you get a high from seeing these messages come in. You know, from an old love in high school or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Actually, is also in your book as well. She connects with with an old in love or an old well, not an old love, but somebody she knew. No, no somebody yeah, she knew. Right. Though, yeah. Sure, a sure, sure, sure. Yes, Somebody course. she knew yes. from her past. Yes. But it can often, I think, with social media, spin mm -hmm. into something much bigger. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, your your the person you well, be. and the person you're confiding in is yeah. no longer your spouse. It's the person on social right. media. And you, yeah. anyway, I'm talking too much. Yeah, no, you <laughs> never. I love Jane. It's well, true. <laughs> um, in, you know, there's no infidelity in, in this yeah. this book of mine, but um, it does deal with that that feeling of you know that the unconventional love, mm -hmm. and the idea that you know you, you feel that your life should look a certain way and be a certain way, and your relationship should you know you should choose this person, have this job and this life. And and sometimes that works out, but sometimes you you realize that you know you you want something that maybe isn't right on paper. Mm -hmm. In the case of Shay and in, in the one and only, you know she falls in love with really the one person she should. Sometimes that has you know it's not always in the context of an affair. But do you think you should always follow your heart in that case? You want to field that one first? I mean, not, maybe yeah, not if you're already else. married, but... Maybe you're not. Exactly. I mean, I think following your heart can sometimes be a justification to just do what you want and it can completely yeah. be self-centered about your, you know, whatever your pursuit is. So I think you have to be careful with what that really means. I think that if you think of it as being true to your, you know, authentic self and yeah. being, you know, following your, you know, authentic path, the path that you're meant to be on, um, it, there's a lot of competing interests when you start talking about that. Like, there's still loyalty to, you know, and, and, and in an ideal world, that's never in conflict with anything else. But yeah. sometimes it can be, you know, whether that's in the uh, context of right. your, your book. Right. Or, you know, several that I've written that could be in direct conflict. And even in the one and only, it's sort of... Um, yeah, there's a big yeah. With, <laughs> yeah, with without two giving friends, it away. without again yeah. being unfaithful, the the two friends hit this this point where you know she you know Shay has to sort of decide: do I do what's right for my best friend, or do I do what's right for me? And that can be tricky. But there's also something else uh, for me reading the one and only, which which I completely loved. Um, and I'm not just I'm not just reciprocating. I love yours Thank too, you. and your setup is genius. Um, but, First chapter, yeah. so juicy. Yeah. yeah. Every read the first chapter really finished. Yeah. But one of the things that I loved in the book is that Shay has this relationship with this person she's not supposed to have a relationship with. And and actually the what's so defining about it is that it isn't giddy. It's actually it's somebody who really knows her. It's really it's a friendship. And I do yes. think I can't actually remember your original question because yes. I'm I'm too old. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Let's go um, far however, I know I had a point to make here, which was something along the lines of um, uh, you know, relationships, I think, the best relationships, the most lasting relationships are the ones that aren't giddy. They don't They don't have that element of hysteria, of insecurity, mm -hmm. I, you know, even because in my that, own life. Right, that right, right. Yeah. I mean, my, my yeah. you know, I'm very happily married, as I said, and, and really, we met, he was my landlord, and, and huh. we, it was very peaceful. I think our, our relationship was defined by a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. And until you have five children, right? Now it's just it's defined by chaos. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Jade has our next question for us. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so in each of your books, with with Gabby in Tempting Fate and with Shay in The One and Only, um, each of these main characters has this really close friendship that kind of anchors her life as much or more as her romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big betrayal in each of these friendships. And I think the way our friendships change as adults is so interesting. And I wonder if you guys in your own lives have had similarly intense friend relationships and if you've had to deal with betrayals of any sort. Which is, I know, is a pretty personal question, but let's, <laughs> let's see. Sure. Um, uh, let's start with Jane. Um, have I had to deal with betrayals? I, you know, I'm sure I have. I mean, there, there's no way I can sit here and say I haven't. I will say that the older I have got, um, the more I have 
well, the more careful I am about my friends. I don't have a lot of friends, and I, I'm really judicious about who who is in my inner circle. Um, and and one of the things that I look for with my friendships is is a, a real sense of safety and trust. And and so I I haven't experienced a betrayal. I'm also somebody who. Um, I, I've certainly been hurt by people, not in as dramatic a way as in either Emily's book or mine, but I, I'm very much a believer in, in, in confronting. There's a saying that I love, which is, um, say what you mean, mean what you say, don't say it mean. And, and certainly I've had friends do things that have made me really uncomfortable and really unhappy, and I've been able to sit them down and say, you know, I love you. And I, I feel so uncomfortable with this behavior. And, and, I, and kind of extra, actually, our friendships have gone on to a much deeper level as a result. Right, right. Yeah. I would, I would echo what Jane says in that, you know, betrayal, you know, a, a straight betrayal, I can't say of it that uh, a, a really close friendship has ever been marred by that. But certainly a sense of just disappointment. Like, can't you do better than that? Like, you know. Yeah. And I, you know, at the same time, I know, and I can think of, you know, the examples that of times when I let, I've let someone down. You know, you know, and and that almost hurts, you know, more because then it's imbued with all that guilt. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and then you have to find that with a, when a friendship is really worthwhile, I think you you have to, you know. Find the path to, to forgiveness if you can, um, but certainly you know when you when you're when you're lied to, I think that's the feeling in in you know that that's you just feel like it's very hard to trust again. So you might forgive, but once you've been lied to, I, I I'm at the age too. That person's just crossed off forever. There's just no there's no there's not enough time. Your family and your very best friends, and I'm also someone who keeps my friends. From the time I was, you know, I had two second grade friends that came to my book party last night, and oh, wow. uh, I mean, two <laughs> second grade, and they weren't even in the same group, you know. They weren't. We weren't all friends. It was separate second grade groups. That's but, um, so I, I can't, yeah. you know, deal with, you know, the the little slight betrayals. Do you agree? Life's too sh it's just Well, too I, I think the big, I think the big things. Well, it depends. I think sometimes, I, little things happen all the time. But I think mm -hmm. a, a, the big betrayal, you know, I had an experience with somebody who was a childhood best friend who lives in New York, mm. and um, and I had asked her to do something for me, and she accidentally blind copied me in on this email, oh. and it was one of those awful things where she really, oh, she God. really she kind of, oh. well, do you know, the email was sort of filled with envy, actually, it, and it was oh. really, it was really jarring and really upsetting, right. and, um, does she know she blind copied you? Well, she did because I had to email her back, and I said, you know, you I didn't found, have to. You could have emailed her. I know that's I not. But here's no, what I said. The day with Jane, that's not much fun. Here's what I said, and I, I, it, this was crafted by by a great friend of mine who, you know, helped me draft this email, and and I said, I found the way you chose to introduce me ugly, tasteless. And illuminating. Oh, oh. that's a great word. So nice that, to be a writer. Right now. Do you know what? Do you know? But the thing was, it was actually right there. With the least well, word. that was a deal breaker because she showed me who she was. Better in her accent too. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have skyped that over to her, that would have been better. And illuminating. And illuminating. But it, I think the best friendships are worth working. For. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, because it's, it's like yeah. a it's like marriage. You know, it's not going to always be. And I also perfect. loved what you said about um, the hardest things are when you've let somebody down. And I actually, the the girl who I consider to be probably my dearest friend, we we had an incident where when I when my first marriage broke up and she was completely there for me, she then had something happen to her, and I was so wrapped up, I was so consumed with my own stuff that I wasn't there for her. And she was able to um, she was able to to tell me that, and we. I was able to hear. It's also about hearing. Listening you know, you hearing, need yeah. instead of jumping on the defense of which so many of us tend to want to do, if you can if you're right. able to hear, right. then you can move on. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if they blind copy you, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> then that's a deal breaker. Um, so we also have super fan Neely Stoley, who's a blogger at A Complete Waste of Makeup. She's a great fan of Emily. They know each other. And she has a <laughs> question for Emily. Um, yes. So being from Texas, born and raised, and actually my fiance and I both went to SMU where you did your research, mm -hmm. I was just curious why you chose Texas um, 
as the background when most of your other books kind of have a bigger city vibe or even not as much of city being the focus. Hey, Neely. <laughs> um, Neely and I met at a uh, after a book signing, and do you remember that crazy guy, Neely, that kept coming? Yeah. The yeah. one that followed us to the restaurant. Exactly. <laughs> and so I said, hey, let's hit the girls who are left. I'm like, let's go get a drink. And um, we had margaritas. So that's how I met Neely. Um, and the crazy guy changed his shirt because I've been calling him white yeah. shirt. It's so obvious, these guys. Some of these guys who come to my signings, you can pick them out right away because they're not paying attention to me. They're looking around. <laughs> but the ratio is so great. It's actually a really smart thing for me to do. Yeah. But then he changed his shirt because I've been calling him white shirt and he showed up with a green shirt. But anyway, enough of that. Um, you know, I, I'm surprised that you would say, uh, you know, that, that big cities and why would you pick tech? What's bigger than Texas? You know, what's well, I mean, like this. I know, town. I know, it's a small yeah. town, but it's um, you know, Texas. I think takes on a character in this book, and mm -hmm. so I needed to go to Texas and do my research, which involved again. You're sensing a theme here: more margaritas, guacamole, <laughs> and uh, football. So um, that was a lot of fun. But and it, this book is set in the in the world of college football in Texas, but I think you you know it's. It's, it's still about relationships, and it could have been set in many different worlds. So, yeah. but, And do you have that personal football connection? That um, just made me I'm very passionate about college sports. Yeah. It's a big part of sort of who I am and my background. And, um, but, uh, and I always wanted to sort of set a book in this world. Um, and I thought it worked well for this one because of some of these themes of loyalty. I think that's such an important part of like team sports, sports and yeah. commitment to something greater than yourself and um, so it just sort of it worked it's um, it was fun to finally to, to finally write a book with that yeah to the backdrop great Meg has a question so, for Jane. Yeah, so I have a question actually um, on behalf of Pamela who's a Goodreads fan so why did you choose to make this character British and how does um, writing about the fallout of an affair change when from the perspective of someone who's British as opposed to American? Um, well, the first question is it's twofold. I am, um, excuse me, I asked to, if I could possibly read my own books a few years ago, and my publisher said, no, 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 Jane, every author wants to read their own books, and they're really awful at it. I said, well, could I at least try? And so I ended up auditioning, and I passed. Wow. And so <laughs> I read, and this was another piece of my heart. So I read my own book, and it, it came out, and the reviews, the, the reviews were mixed. A couple of the reviews said, well, we don't understand. Why is somebody English reading a book that's filled with American characters? And I thought, oh, they've got a really good point. And I can change that. I have the power to change. So I thought, if I want to keep on reading my own audio books, then I should probably it's have a bit more English in that. Um, and also, you know, I live here. I'm a naturalized citizen. My kids are American. My husband's American. This is home. I'm not going anywhere. But I'm still. I didn't grow up here, and and I I actually thought I really do need to to bring some of my Englishness in because I am still. You know, my sensibilities are still so English. You know, in the afternoon I will still stop for a cup of tea. Oh, yes. Everything stops for a cup of tea. Um, and uh, and in terms of how my character uh, reacted. I don't, I don't know that that's any different, actually. I didn't really think about that. My Englishness definitely comes out in Gabby's nostalgia. She's very nostalgic for, mm. for England, and, and her mother comes over. I love that this, part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I know. And when she and meets, meets the, the English yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I think every and woman I think you should guy. do that more. Like, I think yeah. more, in, more yeah. English? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because everyone... Every American I have, is yeah. infatuated, yeah. I mean, let's yeah. be honest, Everyone's with happy. British yeah. people. Yeah. And, and actually, the book I've just finished, which comes out in December. She does two a year, people. Let's talk yeah. about that. <laughs> it blows my mind. I do one every other year. She does. She's four times. I can't imagine. Yeah. She's, no, she's so, and she's so good, too. Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous. You. When do you write with five children? <laughs> well, they're, all, they're older than Emily, so it gets yeah. e oh, really that's, does that's get easier. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. So they in a couple go, of years, you'll be writing yeah. Well, they go off to school, and I, I actually I can't write at home. I, so I, t I grab my laptop, and I go to a little writer's room. And these are this is on a dream day. I used to day. live in Westport. I know exactly. Yeah. Well, I think oh, I do. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about this writers room. It was just actually they opened it thinking that lots and lots of writers would show up and write, right. and I'm the only one. Oh, 
Oh, no. Really? 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 Place that's ice because you said you're an introvert and I'm an introvert. Yeah. Oh, I or just go up. No one comes up there. No one bothers but me. I if sit they at a did, table. would you be at a table with okay, other so Here's my trick. Okay. Because this is fascinating. <laughs> it's, Listen. <laughs> it's a big pair of Bose noise cancelling headphones. Oh, right. When the headphones are on, no, they okay. know not to talk to me. And if the headphones are off, then then okay. I'm good. That's good. Yeah. Because I find a complete crazy din easy to write in. Like <gasps> I love writing in the middle of an airport. You know, just like I love airports to get things. Yeah, to. But okay. if it becomes more intimate than that, like say a you know diner with you know someone one table over, that's a complete distraction. I, I think it's just because like, you're listening. Oh, yeah. and you I feel like you should be like, well hello, how are you today? And that's <laughs> the whole purpose of yeah. going to the diner to write. So yeah. Yeah. I used to write at the library, at, at the local public library, and but then oh, every well it was <laughs> <I know. laughs> everyone and his brother would come in order to every day. People like Jane and it was just like constant it's right. social. people. Yeah, like, it was just, to work. yeah, it was too social. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I do like to leave my house. I I go a bit nuts on my own and I because left to my own devices, I would not leave my house for months at a time. Right. And so mm. this way I have I go out the house so I feel like I'm going to work. It's a routine. And once I'm out, then I can get all the errands done that I need to do. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, Jade is going to send give us another question from a good re good read reader. Okay. Yes. This is a question from Amy Avenatti, who is a fan of both of you guys. And she says that as a person who really enjoys reading books about the deal with relationships and friendships and issues faced by women in society, she really resents the fact that these novels are often dismissed by other people, men and women, as fluff. And she wonders how you guys feel about that and maybe what you think fans and readers can do to help the issue. Jane, would you like to feel that first? Emily. No. <laughs> Jane. Jane. Um, I well, do you yeah. know, I I don't know what to tell you really. I um I started writing about single women in their late twenties, early thirties, and and you know it was the beginning of this genre that that the press leapt on. This was back in 1996 and called chick lit. Um, and it was fantastic to be part of something new and part of something that that just was so huge. You have to remember, I was 27 at the time. I was writing books about young single women, looking for their mystery. I mean, it was the classic, you know, what we now all come to think of as chiclet. I'm now 45 years old. You know, I'm a mother of many. Um, I'm writing about, like, as, and this is exactly the same for right. you as well. We're writing about real issues and just the, and the lives of, of of people like us and. I'm always astonished when I see people, and I do see this a lot, and they say things like, oh, I used to love Jane Green, but I got fed up reading about young single women. And I'm thinking, well, keep but reading. Do you not think that <laughs> yeah. I've grown up too? Yeah. Um, I, I think, thrilled to have been part of this extraordinary movement. I defy anyone to call me a chick now. Um, and... Uh, and I think I, you know, I, I think I write very good books. I, I write mm -hmm. commercial fiction. I'm really happy with what I do. I have a lot of friends who are literary writers, and we sort of joke about how they get the New York Times book review, and they're very happy with that, and I get the numbers, and I'm very <laughs> happy with that. Um, I feel enormously grateful. I do a job that I love, um, and I think that really, I don't think anyone should be ashamed of what they read. I, I think that I. I you know, I, I'm very proud of what I write. The people who tend to be ashamed or say, oh, it's beach trash, but I quite like it, tend to have an insecurity around their own kind of intellect anyway. And I, I just think, you know, no, who, why should we be ashamed of what we choose to read? Okay. Yeah. It's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I really try not to think about the marketing and the labels and all the genre when I tell a story. And I think... It sounds like from some of our conversations, you feel the same. I mean, I try to tell real stories, you know, with real substance um, about relationships. My books are all relationship-driven, and you know, when I'm asked a, a slightly similar question, um, you know, 
uh, will you ever write a different kind of book? I'm, I'm always sort of puzzled by that because I write about relationships and that's what's important to me. That's how, you know, I think that that's what really matters in life and that sort of defines who we are, sisters, mothers, best friends, you know, wives, um, girlfriends on the side, you know, <laughs> in the case of someone we know from Tempting Fate. But, um, you know, and I think those are, those, that, that's what, that's what, matters in life and so mm -hmm. to dismiss that if if there are people out there who just dis dismiss that um, you know I just you know what does that say I think about mm -hmm. what's in, what's what is what's important to them yeah. well there has been I think for the second part of your question there has been sort of you know groundswell of writing about well we need to not dismiss them. We need to have more of these reviews right, right. in you know the New York Times. Is yes. there anything that fans can do? I mean I really don't know what. Yeah. You well, know, to, to here's the thing. When when reader readers know what they want. When you go to the movies, you know what you want. And I think women want, and people who read fiction, and so I say women, it's really mostly women read fiction. But the men who read fiction want the same thing. They want good stories. They mm -hmm. want real stories that they care about with characters they connect to. And I think the same. You, you just talk about romantic comedies for a minute. Mm -hmm. The best romantic comedies, the really rich, layered, interesting romantic comedies, are beloved. They mm -hmm. win awards. Mm -hmm. They're you know they're I wonderful, mean, right? Yeah. Men and women. I mean, yeah. they you know when Harry met Sally. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody dismisses that as. But when you get formulaic and you just throw it together and it's all gimmicky and it's you know this bride's mad at that bride or this you know all, all of those sorts of things, then you're talking about you know fluffy. Chick flicks. Yeah. That's a very different thing. So you can't take the just like you can't summarize about all movies that are romantic comedies. You can't do that with with fiction either. And I think yeah. the, the the readers know the difference. Yeah. And they yeah. and they love the books with meat and substance. And also, yeah. you know, you you look at the people who have lost. I mean, here's Emily with her seventh book. You know, I. I this is my 15th. Yeah. There has Again. to be something Again. more. <laughs> <laughs> she has more children. She has more chickens. She has, yeah, she has the accent. I do have more chickens. But do I though? I don't know, yeah. actually. Yeah. She has chickens. Oh, yeah. We have chicken 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 it's how much you win. I win. win. Oh, right. <laughs> Double the oh. oh, okay. So, but yeah, no, well, speaking of the movie, yeah. actually, we have a, a really good question yeah. from social media. Um, so, Kristen asked this on our Google Plus account. So, Emily, I loved your Facebook comment last night about Emmy Rossa making a great Shay. Who do you picture playing Coach Carr? And I think you can also ask the same question. About yeah. Too. Have you thought about your casting? Your book's been out longer, so. No, you answer first, and then because I, I have a little story. Okay, uh -huh. then I'll just throw out my favorite topic, George Clooney. Yeah. George Woo! Clooney. Talk about George Clooney. <laughs> um, I think he would be the perfect coach car. I do. Yeah. I kept picturing Kevin Costner, but that's Kevin my own Costner. little thing. Dennis Quaid. Yeah. Dennis Quaid. Do it. I mean, there's yes. a lot of music. Yes. And Let's Shay. Talk about and Shay. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this. Just totally off topic, really yeah. quickly. Do you think that his relationship will last, George Clooney's? Uh, I hope. Mm, that's I a good know. question. I, want I hope. I you know. do too. Yeah, I hope. I always, smart, yes. you know, I'm always optimistic about woman. these things. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, different sort of. We can talk. We need to talk later. Yeah, we need to talk. We do. Have <laughs> she has scoop people. <laughs> um, um, and and in terms of me, I never actually think about. I don't. I'm not a movie goer. I have to be honest. So I don't really think about movies. However, a number of people have been tweeting about how Mini Driver would make a great Gabby, oh, sure. and so. Well, here's the beauty sure. of Twitter. I immediately Google Mini Driver Twitter, thinking, how can I get hold of her? And it said, there was a news story from three days before, Mini Driver has retired from Twitter. And I thought, no. no. <laughs> anyway, she hasn't, luckily. So, she of course, I stalk her. No, I, well, I yeah. did. I okay, tweeted good. her. She messaged me back within five <gasps> minutes. So, she has it now. So, we shall see. Oh, wow. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah, she yeah. would be good. She would be good. I think yeah. she'd be great. So we have to wrap up in a okay. little bit, but um, everyone wants to know what you love to read. So Twitter user MeganWu88 wants to know what books do you always recommend to friends? You first. Oh. I have Jane Green. No, I do. <laughs> I do. 
<laughs> people who read me. Well, read no, me and that, that, do you know what that? Yeah, yeah the Amazon. You know, last night at my book signing, the receipts being generated, like all said, you know, when they bought the book, it oh. all said by Tempting oh. Fate. No, I love oh. hearing yeah. that. So that's Can you great. believe we've never met before today? Yeah. No, really? Yeah, well, we've wow. emailed. Oh, but she's my, still, she it's is not my the new same. Best she, my yeah. friend. <laughs> 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 that's odd. You guys have yeah. friend chemistry. Yeah. 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 Um, um, so uh, books to recommend. Oh, I, yeah. I look. I think. Um, I mean, I, I actually do uh, yeah. recommend Emily's. I, I, there isn't one author, but there are books that I, when I read and I love a book, I've just read um, uh, "You Should Have Known" by Jean Hanford oh, so Such a wonderful yes. book. So you know. So then I, I'm going to tell everyone I know to read that. Yeah. Rachel Joyce's book, I can't think of the title of it. Stephen, do you remember? The uh, in, yeah. Imper Imperfect? Yeah, yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. yes um, <laughs> yeah. I, I have some, when I'm on book tour, though, it's like, you know. When do you, you get to read? Yeah, you don't. Do you yeah. read on book tour? Um, I, yeah, I do. I've got I don't read when I'm writing, so I oh. do read on book tour a lot. Well, then you know oh, hotel never read because you're writing all the time because you have two books a year. I'm thinking margaritas here. Um, and just a last question. I know you guys always get advanced copies and kind of know what's going on. Anything you can't wait to read this summer if you're ready yeah. to pack away? Um, I want to read Laurie Moore's short story, mm -hmm. Bark, mm -hmm. and um, Amy Bloom's book is coming out at the end of, yeah, at oh, the end of, I'm really excited awesome. about that. So yeah. I'll be finished with my tour by then. So I, um, on my list, Emma Donahue's new book, the, uh, is it The Frog? The Frog. I loved Frog. Room. Room yeah. was yeah. just what my favorite book for in, in such a long time. Um, it was such and a great also, idea, wasn't it? Oh, it was, it was yeah. so clever. It was hard well. to get into, though, so if you well. have kids. I, I, I yeah. read it, but sometimes, you know, those... Yeah. Not, not like... when your kids are misbehaving. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> and then <laughs> The Vacationers, Emma Straub. That, yeah. I just yeah. finished that. Oh, that? And, oh so good. Okay. Good. I, I'm really desperate to read that. Yay. Yeah. Well, Emily and Jane, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us out there. Jay, Neely, Meg. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, thank um, you. Go to redbookmag.com beach reads to find out how you can submit questions for our second Summer Beach Reads Book Club, which will happen on June 17th. See you then. Okay. Thank you.